You're listening to a download from the outdoorstation.co.uk. Number four, two, three. Hello and welcome back once again to the Outdoor Station and this the very first podcast of 2017. As I record this, it is a very sharp, frosty, sub-zero day. And as you can hear, it's also just starting to rain. It's the type of day where you need and want to keep moving to stay warm. Last night, I had the pleasure of meeting the fine art wildlife photographer Tom Way, someone no stranger to spending hours in conditions like this, waiting for a single image. And as I sit here between shivers, I admire his patience, persistence and downright dogged determination even more. In December, we held our second competition to win a complete DD hammock camping setup. Once again, all entries were compiled and the magic random button was pressed on January the 2nd. Hello? Hello, and a happy new year from Bob at the Outdoor Station. Hi there, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. Who am I speaking with, please? It's uh, Oscar. Oscar. Well, Oscar, nice to speak to you, and I uh, do wish you a happy new year. Obviously, in December, you were one of the many entries that entered our competition to win a DD hammock and tarp setup. Yep. I'm pleased to say that you are our winner this month. Oh, that is fantastic to that's, that's a really good way to start the year. Absolutely. Here we are. It's just starting the new year. We might as well give some stuff away. So I think that's a, <laughs> that's a hammock, that's a tarp, that's a T-shirt, a sweatshirt, a, a cap, and probably a cuddly toy. I have no idea. <laughs> that's absolutely fantastic. That's really, really good news. Excellent. Are you, are you a hammock and tarp user, or is this the first time? So a uh, tarp user... Uh-huh. Um, I'm, I, I, from a Sims, I'm a photographer and I do a lot of weekend events. Um, so I, rather than being bothered with setting up a full tent or anything, I tend to just sling a tarp and sleep on the ground underneath it. Um, but uh, it's getting, the ground's getting a bit hard these days. So <laughs> I, think the was, I was looking around for a hammock and then I saw the competition. Oh, excellent. Perfect. Uh, yeah, perfect. And also their, their cam as well, the camouflage um, uh, variety. So that'll help, obviously, with the wildlife oh, photography. Perfect. Yeah, brilliant. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, definitely. Lovely. Well, stay on the line and I shall take a few more details. Brilliant. Thank you. Self-powered travel. Since 2005, over 8 million people have listened and over 1 million have watched the videos. Podcasts which look at all aspects of self-powered travel, sharing the passion, appreciation and understanding for the outdoors world. The Outdoors Station is a free media entertainment service dedicated to the self-powered outdoors enthusiast. Oscar has now received his prize and we have set in play the January competition, this time to win a complete NeoAir sleep system. And you'll hear how to enter during the show. If, like me, you're cold and chilly and currently considering warmer places and adventurous travel, stay listening to the end of the show as we have a 40% discount code on the price of tickets for the Adventure Travel Show in London Olympia on the 21st and 22nd of January. Now this interview I'm sure will appeal to general lovers of the outdoors and photographers in particular. Please visit the Outdoor Station website and check out a few of the images from Tom and follow the various links to his website and social media for many, many more. If you're an animal lover, I can assure you, you will be blown away by his work. As you'll hear, Tom is a relatively new name in the world of wildlife photography. However, that doesn't detract from his skills or quality of work. Hi, my name's Tom, uh, and I'm a wildlife photographer uh, living in uh, just outside of Windsor. Um, I've been doing wildlife photography for just over five years. So how do you actually start it? Um, I first started um, a few years ago. I wanted to, to document what I was seeing uh, when I was traveling um, in the most aesthetic way possible. And so I thought if I could sell my images as fine art prints, I'd be able to keep traveling um, and keep funding uh, that side of the business. I think the surprising part to most people would be to learn that that was the start of your photography full stop, really. Yes, yeah, that's, I, I wanted to 
I'm very, very ambitious. I wanted to really make sure that the business was going to be a success when I first started. Um, and I thought if I, I, if I can make it work, uh, and I was very fortunate in the way it started. I, I took a few images and they sold well. Uh, and then I was able to go from there. So when you said you, you took images and they sold, are we talking about photographic libraries, sort of commissions? How did it work? So my whole business revolves around print sale. So I'll never upload anything really into stock libraries as such. Um, but I'll go a- around uh, galleries, exhibitions, and that's where those images will be selling. So how did you start finding the customers that would appreciate your fine art work? Yeah, it's, it's always going to be difficult to find your clientele. But um, what I soon realized was that photographers aren't going to buy my work. Um, they're going to want to take their own images. Um, so you've got to find a clientele that um, are wanting to uh, furnish their home um, and put um, wildlife images uh, in, their, in their houses. So people are often living out in the countryside that can can relate to the wildlife that they're seeing. So barn owls, kingfishers, foxes, uh, red deer, they've seen that wildlife and they want an image in, in, in their home. So that's unique and special and obviously of a, a certain dynamic presentation. Yes, yeah, exactly. Now, you won the European Wildlife Photographer of the Year for two years running? Uh, I was awarded. I was awarded, yes. T- two uh, years in a row, I was highly commended in, in that competition. So, yeah, uh, very, very privileged to, to have those accolades. Is that something you entered from cold or were you invited to enter? No, you enter, as, as long as you pay, you're, you're welcome to enter. So, yeah, you put, like with any competition, you pay. Um, and then um, that particular competition is about 17,000 entries. Uh, and, and the judges uh, scrutinise the images and pick out, pick out their favourites. There, there's an overall winner uh, and there's the, the winners of the categories. And then you have some highly commenders as well. When you approach a competition at that level... Mm. Are you allowed to edit your images or are they straight from the camera? How does it work? So you're allowed to edit your images to a certain extent. Um, most of the wildlife photographers will be shooting in, in raw mode, and so they do require some processing. Um, what's not allowed is adding and subtracting any content. So you can't remove um, any distraction or add in uh, another red squirrel or another leopard to, to your image. Uh, you're allowed to add contrast. You're allowed to uh, crop. You're allowed to lighten and darken to a certain extent. Really subtle changes. I view it as anything that you would have done in the dark room, for example. I, I never have experienced being in there, but, but that, that's the principles that are normally applied to big competitions. Well, as I said to you earlier on, you're, you're a digital native, really. You've come to it in pure digital form. And presumably when you started five, six years ago, the actual quality of the digital imagery was very, very high. Yes, yeah. I've never touched a film camera personally, um, but digital photography has enabled me to, to produce a, a business ever so quickly. Um, I couldn't have done that with film. Uh, I've had no courses, no training, but what I've a- enabled myself to do, enabled myself to do is to, uh, to review my work instantly and to look at what I like in photography um, and then improve on that over the last f- well, f- five or six years. Um, with film cameras, uh, the, the learning process would have been very expensive and very slow. You were saying during your talk that the, the technical side of the images were at one level, but actual fact it's getting character and capturing a, a moment uh, which has seen you to be so successful. Yeah, there's, um, well, it's actually three things that I look for. And you're, you're right, the, the, the light uh, is one, the character is, is essential uh, to, to, to the imagery as well. Um, a personality, I'd describe it as trying to capture the animal's personality uh, in a still picture is, is crucial. Uh, and also simplicity. Uh, uh, throughout my portfolio, uh, the majority of my images will carry the simplicity. So yeah, three things, the character, uh, the light or simplicity is what I look for. Your background, as I understand it, is in the sports industry. That's where you initially trained to to work in. Uh, And you made the massive step, really, to to go from, I presume, you know, a reasonable background to something which is very, very um, hard work to achieve a good name so quickly. What What was the turning point? What was a key point? Or was there a key person somewhere that just gave you the confidence to make that step? It's a, it's a good question because, yes, when you first start, you, you look at uh, how well other people are doing and you think, goodness, that's going to take years and years to achieve that. 
I, I'd never, I never got too carried away. And I think I, I keep that same philosophy now. Um, just every day, head down, just carry on working. And, and I, I say it to lots of people, actually, you never really get a chance to reflect uh, at this time of year, it's uh, being, being just gone the new year, you do get a small part of reflection and you sit back for a week or so and think about what you've achieved. But to, but to be honest, you're so busy, um, constantly traveling, constantly exhibiting that in truth, I don't often reflect on, on what's, what's been achieved. And, and when I do, I, I, am, I am very proud. It's, it's been a, a really great couple of years. Mm. And what I was thinking, when you first started, though, presumably... You were going out cold. There was the, there was your initial purchase for whatever equipment you used at the time. Uh, I presume you didn't have a, a, a an open wallet that you could buy everything. So you started with I think you described it in your talk as a basic camera setup, yes, yeah. which is still available now, or a version of it mm-hmm. is still available now. And you took a flyer, basically. Uh, it's a risk. It's a risk. Um, but I, I I went to university. I had a degree in sport. And in, in all honesty, if, if, if the photography ever failed on me, um, I could go back to, to being a personal trainer. That's, that's what I'm qualified in. Um, and, and that was the comforting factor in, in the progression. Uh, if, if it didn't work, I said, if it didn't work in two years uh, and I wasn't able to fund myself, then I'd, I'd go back to doing that. But uh, things took off in a, in a big way and I, I didn't look back after that. Being the age that you are, and being a digital native, as we discussed earlier, you, you've also matured with the world of social media. Mm. And so you've got a handle on all these things at the same time. However, as we all know, everything takes a certain amount of time and a certain amount of absorbing um, uh, attention. Uh, you've got shoots to plan. You've mm-hmm. got ideas you want to, to achieve. You've no doubt got commissions as well. And at the same time, you have to keep your audience sort of uh, excited by your, your activities. How do you manage it all? It's, it's difficult. Uh, and I think as the business grows, um, there's your, your time gets uh, eaten up very quickly. Uh, when the business first started, I'd, I'd go on maybe two trips a year. I'd give 10 talks a year and do two exhibitions. And I was twiddling my thumbs thinking, how am I going to make it work? And, and now sort of five years down the line, um, you're, you're working uh, night, night and day to do it. Uh, you're right. Social media is very imp- such a powerful tool. It's all about prioritizing uh, making sure that the public are seeing your, your latest images, uh, keeping some back for competitions. Um, uh, to be honest, I, I, and now I have a, a, t- a small team of people helping me, um, employed um, through, through the business, um, a, a PA. Um, I've got um, my, my printers uh, that are set up um, uh, with order sheets. So, so orders come through uh, and then they're, they're mounted, printed um, and couriered to the customer without uh, me actually doing anything but taking the photograph. And, and that must be a massive relief for you. Expensive, but <laughs> an expensive uh, outlay. But uh, yeah, no, it is a relief. And, and uh, I soon learned that my skill set uh, isn't in answering emails. It's not in, um, in all the logistics uh, of, of exhibiting. Uh, it's, it's my, my skill set is taking the photographs and, and uh, giving talks and, and, uh, and running trips and teaching people. So um, I, I thought that really, if, if I can afford it, then I should really have somebody do uh, those bits for me. Let's take, for example, the preparation and planning you do for uh, a UK-based shoot. Mm-hmm. Um, you showed some lovely images there of the red squirrels and deer and, and uh, various things which are local to you and also in Scotland. What, what's, what's your process of work when you decide you're going to shoot? So we say the red squirrel. So f- for something like the red squirrel, it, it's, well, firstly, uh, the location. Um, so there's the various um, locations up in, in the Cairngorms National Park, uh, other photographers that can help uh, with, with guiding you to, to different locations and, and um, with you uh, to, to, to take the imagery. Um, so location is, is the first thing. Time of year is the second. Uh, the time of year is, is really important. And for me, um, I'd always try and go in the winter where I've got either snowfall uh, or the big fluffy, uh, fluffy coats uh, on the squirrels. Um, those are the two major things that I'm looking for, location and time of year. And how do you do that research? Is it purely online or is it word of mouth? A, a lot throughout the, all, of, all of the work that I do, whether I'm photographing red deer, red squirrels uh, or, or lions, um, it's, it's a huge amount of research. Uh, on, it's, it's all about location. Uh, there's no point in travelling halfway across the world um, or, or driving up the country and finding that it's not the right time of year. So um, I, I, th- I think uh, the, the preparation is, is so important. Uh, and, and in reality... Um, 
given the time, anyone can drive around the country and uh, or, or fly to, to Kenya. Um, but but if it's big, if you're there at the right time of year, then you'll get the the, the weather or, or the the conditions or, or the certain images that you're looking for that set set your shots aside. So how do you place yourself in the position to get that image? Then, obviously, we're not only talking about the location as regards where the squirrel may be mm-hmm. or where the, the squirrel's habitat, as it were, but also there's being in the right place for the light in the morning or yeah. in the evening. Uh, and the equipment that, that you would prepare yourself uh, take with you to to do that. So with with a certain shoot, um, I mean, the red squirrels. Um, most of the red squirrel work that I've done will be uh, hide based. Um, so I'll be be sitting in a hide, much like the red foxes. It does depend on on, on the subject. Is this a portable hide or one that's this, sort of set up? Set, a set up hide. Okay. Um, so it's a it's a permanent hide. I, I do use portable hides. So w- with the fox hide that that as I own myself, uh, I, I built the hide uh, about five years ago. Uh, it's dug into the ground for a perfect angle. Um, I've not taken into account anything like the wind, um, but what I have taken into account is is, is sight and hearing from the fox so uh, there's a there's a mesh net a camouflage mesh net that i'm poking my lens out of the hide with um that hide isn't soundproof but what i'm doing is wrapping clothing around my lens to to dull uh, and nullify the, the noise coming out of the camera um and then the foxes are coming into the meadow for me to photograph uh, if i need to use a portable hide um i'm setting that up um, a few days beforehand so the foxes are used to that uh, used to the smells um, and the sight of it, and then I can position myself anywhere in the meadow uh, and take a different angle. And so do you do research the few days beforehand and check out the fox runs and see where the fox is actually going and possibly which way they're going as well? I, I do check out the, the, the habits, the general habits of the wildlife, but actually what I find in my photography is that although I need to be where the subject is, I actually prefer it if the subject is where I want it to be um, because backgrounds and foregrounds and lighting is so important in my photography so if I find that the fox is going through an area of shade uh, or an area where there's a very cluttered background I probably won't bother to set my hide up there even if it's a very popular spot for the fox what I'll tend to do is set up the hide in, in an area where I really think it's going to be aesthetic uh, great lighting conditions uh, and wait for the fox to come into that position <laughs> Every month, we're holding a special competition where you can win some fabulous outdoor gear. It's a great way to support the outdoor station. The more entries we get, the better the future prizes. During the month of January 2017, the prize is a top-of-the-range outdoor sleeping set. This includes the lightest three-season backpacking mat, the Neo Air X-Lite Regular, a luxurious 100% premium silk sleeping bag liner, and a practical lightweight pillow sack. The total weight of all these items is only 526 grams, and the combined value is 180 pounds. Simply answer the following question and text in your A, B or C answer before the closing date of the 31st of January, and you will be automatically entered. You can enter a maximum of five times from the same UK registered mobile phone number. So this month's question is, in the fairy tale Sleeping Beauty, the princess is brought back from the curse of endless sleep by a kiss from A, a frog, B, a donkey, or C, a prince. To be in with a chance of winning, all you have to do is text OUTDOORS and your answer of A, B, or C to 82055. Or post your answer with your name and contact phone number to competition, the outdoors station, PO Box 924, Worcester, WR4, 4GB. Entries are open to anyone aged 16 plus and you must have the bill payer's permission. Text costs £1 plus your standard network rate and the competition closes at the end of each month. Entries received after that date will not count but you may still be charged. The winner will be contacted within three days of the competition closing and they may appear in future programmes. For full rules plus terms and conditions, please go to theoutdoorstation.co.uk slash competitions. Let's get down to the nitty gritty then. So you've set the hide Mm -hmm. uh, and you're heading out to obviously achieve a shot. What time of day do you go out? What sort of comfort do you take with you? In terms of time of day, um, I'll, most of the animals that I'm photographing uh, in the UK and around the world are very active dawn and dusk. Um, 
which helps with the lighting. For me, I'm not often photographing in the middle of the day. Um, I might be on location, but I probably won't take any images if it's bright sunlight. So given that the animals are more active during early morning, late evening, and the light is very special, or it can be, uh, that's when I'm most taking most of my images. Four o'clock, five o'clock in the morning? What sort of Depends time? on sunrise. It, yeah, or, or, yeah. I suppose, in short, yeah, it all, it's, my, my activity is dictated by the sun. Right. Um, so I don't personally do any, any night photography. I don't use flashes. Um, so my, my shots will be determined by the sunlight first hour after sunrise, last hour before sunset. And well, in terms of comfort, in fact, I, 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 don't, I don't take much, to be honest. I might take a flask of tea and a sandwich, yeah. but uh, yeah, I, I, um, I figure that if it, you're, you're not going to be lying there for more than um, the, the, from sunrise to sunset, so it's, it's not so bad. Okay, but I mean, sort of clothing-wise, you you're taking layers of clothing just to allow yourself some some warmth. It, it obviously it would depend, depend on the time of year. Um, I'm terrible in the cold, really bad. Um, so I'll be wrapping myself up. Um, I have a, a fantastic uh, Arctic coat that, that I'm, I use, um, which is a rab rab clothing, which is which is really uh, a, a great um, a great addition to my clothing. I'll be wearing waterproof trousers if I need uh, thermals underneath, gloves uh, in the winter, especially a hat as well. Mostly dull mute to clothing uh, non rustle as well it's surprising how many coats you buy always rustle when you move um, so something that, that doesn't rustle too much in the summer I'll pretty much always wear long sleeves um, and long trousers uh, long sleeve top uh, you never know where you're going to be lying um, insects bugs or, um, snakes thorns even okay. um, it's got it's important so are you actually lying or sitting for most of these hides? Most of, in the hides that, that I'm trying to work in myself, I'm, I'm lying down. Uh, the best shots are at eye level. It does depend what you're photographing. In a red, with a red deer, I'll be standing up because it's eye level. Uh, with a water vole or, or a fox or a hedgehog, I'll, I'll be lying down. Um, normally on a, on a mat, um, on a camouflage mat, so that um, it, it soaks up a bit of the moisture and I don't get cold. And how long do you often have to wait to, to get a shot that you feel is acceptable? That, that's, that really does vary. It could be minutes. I could take the shot within, within minutes of being there. Um, or it could be, well, affinity, I, I guess. I, I've, I've, I've lied in wait for, for days and months and years and not got the shot that I'm really looking for. Um, so, yeah, I, on, on average, I'd say if, if, if I sit for a, a couple of weeks on a shoot... Uh, if I give myself 14 days, I, th- I really think I'm going to come up with something really, really nice. I think it's worth mentioning to, to the listeners as well, really, that you're not um, a quantity photographer. You're mm. a quality photographer. So just explain to people the type of decisions that you make before you press the shutter. I'm, for me, I'm, I'm looking for those things, uh, as I say. I'm looking for, the, for the, either the right light. I'm looking for either the character or I'm looking for the simplicity those are three things that I'm I'm really looking for in my work um I'll always go for for quality over quantity uh, in my work which, which suits my portfolio um and to be honest I much prefer to maybe take eight to ten pictures a year of really a good standard rather than have a hundred images sitting in in my library but as I understand it, actually on a shoot, for example, the red mm-hmm. squirrel, you'll only take, once a once squirrel comes into view and you get the composition looking right, you'll only take two or three pictures then. For me, I don't see the point in, in taking 100 shots of the squirrel in the same pose. Um, I'll, I'll wait until it does something different or something interesting. Um, I'll always take a burst, like a burst of three. I think there's nothing more frustrating than taking a one single shot and then having the animal blinking. So normally a burst of three, but yes, I won't stand there and take 100 shots of the squirrel sitting there if it's doing exactly the same thing. For the people who are keen photographers, there are various things which obviously we are all aware of, um, myself being one of them, in the sense that you've got a focus point, you've got the um, mode that you might be using, and you've obviously got the white balance to take into account. Mm-hmm. So what's your routine for something, using the red squirrel as an example again? Are you setting the white balance for a, a, a white reading at the time, or do you use a set Kelvin setting? And then when it comes to the composition, uh, I'd like you to explain to people how you keep the important part of the animal in focus. So in terms of settings... 
what I look for first is, is shutter speed. Um, there's nothing more frustrating than having the perfect shot, but it's slightly blurry. So shutter speed is, is for me, the m- most important thing. Um, and then allowing the, the aperture to, to, to blur and create nice foregrounds and backgrounds for you as well. Um, but they're all linked, and it, ISO will be linked to that as well in terms of shutter speed. In terms of white balance, I don't actually go on anything but my eye. So I'll look at the image and then look at the scene in front of me and look at the image again. And all I'm trying to do is replicate the scene in front of me. Um, I might shoot slightly warmer for more vibrant colours, but, but only subtle changes, nothing to, to almost falsify the scene. One of the most important things as a photographer, when you're working with a single focus point, which is the way you like to work, mm-hmm. and you're focusing on the eyes of the animal concerned, particularly the bigger animals, obviously it's a, it's a, it's a slightly larger thing to focus on, which is good. But the animal is obviously moving. And uh, it's either moving left or right or coming towards you. Um, there's the focusing, which I presume is an automatic focusing system that you use from that point of view. How do you keep the point of focus that you're interested in in the right place on the camera? How, you know, I'm talking about the practicalities yes, of the yes. mechanics of what you're doing at that yeah. time. So uh, I'm using a Canon 1DX, which has a multiple array of focusing points. And yes, I am used to using one, but I make that focusing point work really hard for me. So what I'm interested in is the eye being as sharp as possible. So I'm making sure that my focusing point, wherever the animal is in the frame, is over the eye. Uh, and, that, and that's what's important for my overall image. So by using my thumb um, and the, the focusing uh, button, I'm making sure that that's pressed down and then rotating uh, the focusing point until it's over the eye. So you're not using the actual not, an automatic focusing uh, on the lens? The lens is autofocus, yes, but then I've got to change my focusing point so that the, the focusing locks on to the animal, uh, the, the point of interest on the animal. I mean, that takes a lot of skill to get that and work at a speed that's equivalent to the animal that's moving. Do you find you miss you know, some shots because you're just fumbling sometimes? Yeah, you will, you will miss, you'll miss loads of shots. And to be honest, if I sat back and thought about the shots that I've missed, it would be quite demoralising. Um, <laughs> interesting, a lot of my work is, is portraiture, uh, wildlife portraiture. Uh, I find that actual portraits of animals sell so much better than action. Um, you can, well, get across their character so much more and people feel attached to the imagery more than the action, um, which leads back to, to the point of, um, the fact that, to be honest, I don't really photograph a lot of action. But when it does happen, um, yes, I'll, I'll miss a few shots and, and also I'll get them as well. So um, the, the trick is to, to improve uh, constantly uh, with, your, with your techniques. What about filters? You, you didn't mention filters at all in your talk. Do you use anything like Polaroid filters, neutral density, anything like that? I don't use any filters, no. No, n- nothing, that, nothing that I've used in... I think uh, trying to use the light to its, its advantage all the time is, is really important. Uh, and to be honest, um, I think, as I mentioned in the talk earlier, um, the more kit that you carry sometimes, the more decision making you have to make at the split second that the animal's going to do something. Um, and if you're constantly changing lenses, changing filters, you will miss your shots. And let's come on to the kit for a couple of minutes. And there, are, there are keen photographers amongst us who will want to know how many lenses and how many boxes and how many bags you're carrying with you. And batteries, of course, that's probably the most important thing. Yes, yeah. So my kit bag is, is really simple, actually. I've, as I just said, I think that if you have all the kit in, in the world, then you've got a lot of decisions to make before you press the shutter. Um, I, I use a, a pair of uh, Canon 1DXs. Always carry a backup camera. I think it's very important. Um, I've been known to drop a few in the past in either a river or uh, off, a, off a side of a vehicle, and I'm glad I've had a backup with me. Uh, I carry a 400 lens at the moment, a 2.8-400 Canon lens, a 70-200, so a small medium zoom, and also a wide-angle lens as well, just in case the wildlife uh, presents a sort of an opportunity for, for a wider scope. Um, I'll carry three, uh, four batteries actually, in fact, four batteries with me on, on any location, um, not many memory cards. I, I, I might have two, two or three 32 gig cards, um, a couple of 16 gigs, and, and again, quality uh, over, over quantity on that one. And then when you're in the evening, presumably when you're reviewing your images or at least checking them, do you then download them to a laptop or something? Yes. Yeah, so on location, I'll always back up to a hard drive, but then I'll never delete from the card. So on location, I've always got 
two copies of every shot. Um, it's not until I get home, I've been through my images very thoroughly. I've backed up every image up multiple times, five times uh, will I then delete images from the card uh, once I've reviewed them properly. Mm, as I say, d- digital images don't exist unless they exist in at least three places. <laughs> scary stuff, it's <laughs> yeah. scary. You're obviously a busy guy. Not only are you taking the photographs and, and servicing your customers as well, but you're also doing a lot of talks. You do mm-hmm. a lot of talks around the country uh, and you run courses yes. and take people on different adventures and so on. Tell me a bit more about that. Yeah, so I, I soon realised that... Um, there's, there's going to be different stages to the business. Um, not everyone that comes up um, uh, to my exhibition is going to want to, to buy a piece of work. They might want to take an image that's, that's similar uh, and learn or learn how to take one that, 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 that they want to put their, their own picture on their wall. So I figured that if I start running courses in the UK and overseas, I can take people with me and, and share my passion for wildlife and, and teach them uh, the basics or, or, or more advanced techniques to wildlife photography. And what kind of person comes along? Is there an average type of person that, that, that joins your courses? That really varies as well. Um, some people are, are, are along on the trips to, to learn so much uh, for everything from turning their camera on to learning the difference between a good background and a bad background, uh, shutter speeds, apertures, ISOs. Processing is another huge part of, of my trips. I, I teach people how to process uh, their images. And, and But some people come along... Uh, more advanced photographers they come along purely for location so perhaps they don't know where to photograph a kingfisher or, or a fox cub um, or, or an otter so then I'll, I'll lead them and guide them to the location and they're, fa- they're perfectly capable of taking some fantastic shots once I get them in, lo- in location. And what's the biggest surprise that they tend to find from their own experience from doing these? One of the biggest um, surprises or, or, or the biggest changes that, that, I, that I tend to see is it's actually composition. Uh, I think that's something that people don't do a lot when they first start photography, myself included when I first started. It's all about getting the animal in the frame to start with. You just want a picture of a sharp subject. And the biggest change I see in people is, is learning to compose the images correctly in camera. Um, I think it's a big part and a big stepping stone to take. As I said, you're a busy guy. Obviously, just the first week now of January, mm-hmm. and this is the first talk of the year. But to finish, just give us an idea of how this year is going to pan out for you. What have you got planned? Yeah, so already uh, it's, the year is fully booked. Uh, I'm, 2018 is almost fully booked, and I'm planning 2019 as we speak. So it's, it's an incredibly busy schedule. Um, as far as this year goes, uh, I've got uh, for the next... Um, 30 days I've got 30 talks booked in 30 days I've got uh, uh, I'm off to the Masai Mara Um, I'm leading a trip of of 12 people uh, out to uh, out to Kenya to photograph lions leopards elephants and then I'm working on my own portfolio for for another three weeks Uh, and then I jump to to Sumatra after that to photograph the orangutan um, before coming back and doing some exhibitions around Windsor around Reading uh, around Oxford area uh, before going off to Namibia uh, in June um, just to work in the, in the desert and take 12 people out, um, or 13 people, in fact, we're going out with uh, to teach them how to photograph the desert elephants and the desert lions out there. So that's the first part of the year. Uh, and then going on, I'm leading um, about a month's worth of safaris in Zambia uh, with, with just groups of small groups of six on that one. Um, and then the, I guess we're into the busy Christmas selling period again. Well, well, it's been very enjoyable to see your images. Uh, Wonderful to hear your talk, and thank you very much for taking the time of chatting with me. No problem at all. Thank you for having me. Thank you. My thanks for Tom for joining me and for being so open about his work and how he goes about it. I'm sure you found it really interesting. Please do check out the links on the Outdoor Station website, and that will take you over to his website, uh, more images details about forthcoming talks and of course courses and social media i mentioned at the top of the show about the adventure travel show at london olympia on the 21st and 22nd of january well if you visit the website which is adventureshow.com or call 0871 230 7159 and use the discount code outdoors station you'll get a 40% saving on the door price. All those details will be on the Outdoor Station website as well. I hope to be there myself, so if you spot me, do come along and say hello. 
So that concludes this week's show. Please visit the Outdoor Station and maybe join in our newsletter section or drop me an email with some feedback. I'd be gratefully received. Until next time, folks, spare a thought for people like Tom. Lying patiently on the frozen ground on a day like today for hours, waiting for that perfect shot of a hare, a squirrel or a fox. Brilliant pictures, but they must be mad. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To hear or see more from our extensive free library, please visit theoutdoorstation.co.uk. Thank you.